Hello and welcome to Winging It. So this is part three of my series in which I take a look at the maths behind Wingspan. So if you haven't seen the other parts of this series, I recommend checking those out. I'll put a link to the playlist in the top right hand corner. In the first part of this series we took a look at the hunting powers in the base game of Wingspan and looked at which of these is stronger. And in the second part we took a look at the bird feeder. So we looked at probabilities of rolling each kind of food, what your expectation should be, when resetting the bird feeder. And this third part, we'll be taking a look at card drawing. If you've played Wingspan before, you'll know that whenever you draw cards, you get a choice from one of three face-up cards versus drawing blind from the deck. And drawing from the deck is always a bit of a gamble, but I think being able to understand the number of cards in the deck, different types of cards, and the breakdown of these can really give some good insight into how likely you are to draw a certain type of card that you might be looking for. And that's just going to put you in a better position to make the best decision possible. Yeah. Think about it like you're playing blackjack or poker or any sort of card game like that. You know, standard deck of cards is obviously going to be much smaller and much simpler than the Wingspan deck. But having an understanding of the values of the cards in the deck, the breakdown, the different suits, is really going to help guide you on whether to stick or twist, whether to raise or fold. And I think a similar approach could be taken here in Wingspan. So in addition to looking at these probabilities, we'll take a look at a few different strategies that focus around card drawing, as I think these are really able to best make use of the probabilities that are at play here. You know, I think at a basic level, just allowing yourself to see more cards is going to give you a much better chance of finding something good in the deck. You know, cards like the Ruddy Duck and the Common Yellow Throat and the Pied Bill Grebe these are top tier wetland birds for this very reason. You know, they allow you to draw two cards and discard one. And just that ability to see more cards. You know, with a single one of these you can look up to four cards in a turn. But a pair of these is going to let you look at six. And just through the volume of cards that you can see with one or two of these in your wetlands. You're really going to find something good. I saw a really good article on Wingsplain recently. Where they took a look at this so called card gambit strategy which is all about quickly setting up a wetlands that is going to let you see lots of cards. And I thought this was an excellent introductory overview of this kind of strategy. Um, but I want to delve a little bit deeper into things and, you know, look at the numbers at play behind the scenes and see if these back up what we think we know about this kind of card gambit strategy. So, like I mentioned before, there are kind of four key strategies that I'm going to focus on in this video that make best use of this card drawing. And in each scenario, we're going to take a look at some of the numbers behind the scenes. And that's really going to help guide us uh, decide whether these strategies are going to work reliably for us or not. So before we get into those examples, um, I'm just going to set the scene a little bit, just in terms of the probability distribution that we're going to be looking at here. So for this kind of situation where we are looking for a certain type of card in the deck of cards, we're going to be using something called a hypergeometric distribution. And that has a probability mass function which looks like this. So this has a few different elements in it, um, but we're going to break down each of those so we know what we're working with here. So the first kind of key number we've got here is this big N, which is going to be our population. So that's just the deck of cards that we have to draw from when we're playing Wingspan. The next one we have to look at is small n, so this is the number of cards we're drawing at any given time. Next we have big K, which is the number of possible successes in the deck. So this will be you know, a particular kind of card of interest. You know, Maybe we're looking for a bird with a certain power, or one that goes into a certain habitat. This is going to be the number of that type of card that we're interested in potentially drawing. And finally we have small k, which is the number of observed successes. So that's just going to be how many of those specific cards of interest we draw at a given time. Now in each of our examples that we take a look at, we are going to use this formula to put together a graph that's going to show us how likely we are to draw at least one of each type of card when going from the deck. So in reality, you know, it might look quite complicated, we've got kind of four different things going on, um, but in each case we're actually only going to be changing one of these. So we know that our deck of cards is always going to be the same, there's always going to be 180 cards there. The number of observed successes, that's small k, 
we're going to be interested in any number of those. So you know whether we draw one of this kind of card or you know four or five at the same time, uh, we're going to count all those the same. We're just interested in if we get at least one. And the small n, the number of cards drawn, that's going to be what changes uh, along the x-axis of our graph. So um, that's not something we have to worry too much about. The only real thing we need to you know, consider inputting is this big K. So that's going to be the number of possible successes in the deck. So like I mentioned, this is going to be entirely dependent on what kind of card we're looking for. Um, but once we have that information, we'll be able to put together a graph that looks like this. So as I said, this is looking at drawing a certain number of cards. So this will be our small n from the formula and then plugging that in with all the other numbers into our probability mass function and finding out what the corresponding probability is. So like I said, now that we've got that context at play, we can take a look at the first of our four examples, which is Raven digging. So this is a term I first heard from Tuck and Cash, where they talked about the concept of getting cards like the Ruddy Duck down quickly and just digging through the deck to, to find these really strong cards like the Raven. So this is one of the strongest birds in the game, uh, just allowing you to gain that much food in your grasslands while also scoring points through laying eggs is such a strong power. And yeah, if you've ever played with it or played against it, you'll understand just how strong this, this bird can be. Um, so there's two ravens in the game. There's a the common raven here and also the Chihuahuan raven. And there's also two crows which are quite similar. So those also let you discard an egg, but they only gain a uh, single food from the supply rather than two in the case of the raven. Um, but for this example, I will include both ravens and both crows. So as I mentioned before, in each of these examples, what we're going to take a look at is what are the inputs we need? So what are the numbers that are going to need to plug into this probability distribution formula? Then we'll take a look at a graph, which is going to plot this probability depending on how many cards we've drawn. And then finally, we'll take some key outputs from this. So how likely are we to find these cards after drawing a certain number of cards from the deck? So for our first example, where we're digging for the ravens and the crows, our inputs are going to be that we have four possible cards in the deck. So two ravens and two crows. And our total number of cards in the deck is 180. Now, technically, there are going to be less than 180. Uh, obviously, you know, for each player, you're going to get five starting cards. And then there's going to be three in the tray. So this is going to reduce slightly. But I'm going to just stick with 180 for simplicity. Um, it's not going to change the overall numbers too much here. Now, we can take a look at the graph. So this is going to show probability uh, depending on the number of cards drawn. So you see, obviously, zero cards drawn, you're going to have a zero probability. And then as that increases and you get closer and closer to drawing all the cards in the deck, you are going to reach that 100% limit. But I think it's quite interesting to see the behavior of the probability in between those two endpoints. You know, it's not a linear relationship. It doesn't just increase equally for each card drawn. So you'll see it sort of starts off quite steep, but then it's going to taper off as we draw more and more cards. Now there's kind of two key outputs that I'm going to take from each of these examples. The first of those is how long is it going to take to reach a 50% chance of finding one of these cards? And in the case of the Ravens, it's 29 cards. So you can kind of see that from the graph. You see the point at which the red curve is going to cross over that 50% probability. Um, so yeah, that's going to give you an idea of, okay, how long before I have a reasonable chance of drawing one. And the second thing I'm going to take a look at each of these is how long until you reach an expectation of one. So in this case, our expectation will reach one after 45 cards. So it's quite a lot of cards. Um, I think really what this is going to tell you is, you know, this probably isn't the most sustainable of strategies. You know, it's going to work out occasionally, but if you need to be looking at 45 cards, I think most games, you're not going to look at 45 cards across an entire game. So trying to do that early in the game in particular, you know, even with cards like the Ruddy Duck, the Yellow Throat, the Pipe Bill Grebe, it's going to be so difficult to achieve this. Now the next example that we're going to take a look at here is digging for a forest bird. So I've talked about this before on both my channel and on Tuck and Cash's channel, um, particularly in their video looking at top 10 tips for wingspan. And that is the importance of building up your wetlands first and then your forest. You know, having a good wetlands with cards like the common yellow throat is going to help build up your forest but it doesn't work the other way around so 
you can have as many good forest birds as you want that are going to get you loads of food. If you can't draw the cards to go in your wetlands, yeah, you can have all the food in the world that you want. It's still not going to help you get those cards. Um, but as we'll see here, you know, one or two of these strong wetland birds and a couple of food at the start of the game, eventually you'll you know, dig your way into one of these good forest birds and then you can get that down in your forest and suddenly all these extra cards you've drawn are not going to go to waste because you can discard those in your forest to get extra food. So yeah, I think this is a really key point that having these strong wetland birds is going to allow you to save turns not only in your wetlands but it's going to let you save turns in your forest. And again another point I've talked a lot about on this channel is that turns are your most valuable resource in this game. So if you're able to save turns in two habitats here, you can spend more of those turns, you know, laying eggs in a strong grassland engine or playing big point birds later in the game, and that is just going to help you score so many more points. But sticking with this scenario, again, we can take a look at um, some of the inputs and outputs here. So in this case, we have what I would consider to be 10 A-tier forest birds. So these are all either costing a single food or in the case of the red start, costing two food, but with a really strong power. So these will all either give you extra food from your forest, in the case of the red start, the gnat catcher and the white start. They might give you eggs from the chipping sparrow and the dove, or give you points through cached food, like we see with the chickadees and the gnat hatches. So I'd consider these all to be those 10 strong forest birds that you'd be looking to, to find from the deck. So again, as with our previous example, we can take a look at our inputs first, so in this case we have those 10 possible cards that we're looking for, those 10 top tier forest birds. And again, out of 180 cards in the deck as per our assumptions. Again, we can take a look at the graph. So you see it's going to look quite similar. And in this case, the graph is shrunk down along the x-axis just because you know, there's more cards here to choose from. We're going to reach those high probabilities much sooner. So just for ease of viewing, it's shrunk down by half. And again, the key outputs that we can take away from this, so first of all, our 50% chance threshold is after 12 cards, which is quite low, so that's reassuring. And our expectation reaches 1 after 18 cards. So again, quite a low number. If you have you know, just a single one of those ruddy duck style cards in your wetlands, that's sort of 4 or 5 turns of, of card drawing that you'd expect to find this. You know, even better if you have 2 of those and you're able to see 6 cards a turn. That's only three turns. So within three turns, not only have you drawn lots of cards that you can then turn into points or food, but you've drawn that really strong forest bird that's going to help build up your forest and allow you to get more cards down. So sticking with this example, I think there's a really good scenario that we can take a look at here, which again comes back to this decision of, do I take from the tray or do I draw blind from the deck? And in this scenario, we have the Cooper's Hawk, which I'd consider to be a decent forest bird. I think it's probably in, in B tier. So it's not quite as good as those other A tier birds we looked at, but it's perfectly serviceable. Um, but really, you know, a key question in this scenario is, do you take that Cooper's Hawk or are you going to gamble and hope that you can get one of those stronger A tier forest birds from the deck? And this kind of question is going to come up all the time in Wingspan. You know, you're always going to find yourself in these situations of, do I stick with what I've got or do I gamble and try and get something better? And certainly I think earlier in the game, when you've got more time, you've got more turns left, you can afford to, to gamble a little bit more and spend those turns you know, drawing blind from the deck. I think certainly if you do have cards like the Ruddy Duck in your wetlands, you know you can draw a few cards from the deck and then maybe with the last card of the turn, take the Cooper's Hawk and it's at least something. It's that kind of plan B. But for me, I think in this scenario, I'd certainly be, be gambling from the deck because you know, not only are you giving yourself a good chance of finding that strong forest bird, but you know, maybe you find a raven or a crow or some other strong birds as well that you can look to add. So yeah, certainly it's going to be entirely situational, but you know, as we saw on the previous page, it's only going to take you a few turns to find that strong forest bird. And then once you've got that down, you're suddenly unlocking so many more options just with that extra food you can get. So moving on to the next scenario, we're going to take a look at the grassland tuck and draw style birds. So in this case we've got the barn swallow here, but um, there are five of these kinds of birds in total. So we've also got uh, the American robin, the house finch, the purple martin, and the violet green swallow. But they all have this 
power type which allows you to tuck a card from your hand and draw a replacement card either from the deck or the tray. Um, and these cards in general are some of the strongest in the game just because they score points through that tucking action but also it allows you to turn not so good cards that you might have drawn into much better cards from the deck or from the tray. So these cards in general are going to uh, again allow you to spend fewer turns in your wetlands which means you can spend more turns scoring points playing big point birds. So again now as with our previous examples we can take a look at our inputs here. So this time we have five possible cards in the deck that we're looking for and again 180 cards that we're assuming and so the graph is going to look quite similar again but our key outputs this time we can take away are that we're going to reach 50% chance after 24 cards and our expectation reaches 1 after 36 so you know, if you're seeing 6 cards a turn you can expect to find one of these within about 6 turns which is not too bad and I think if you combine this with these previous scenarios you know if you're digging for a raven or you're trying to find that good forest bird you know, chances are you're going to find one of those but you might also find one of these at the same time you know these aren't mutually exclusive you've got a good chance really of getting both of these relatively quickly and then you can save yourself turns later in the game not having to draw cards now the final scenario we're going to look at is uh, slightly different in that we're going to move away from this ruddy duck type of card um, but instead we are going to look at um, another strategy which is centered around card drawing and that is a full tuck so I've talked about this kind of full tuck strategy before on my channel in my engine building series um, but really a full tuck is just any sort of wetland engine that is going to generate you cards through the drawing cards action it's going to generate you points through tuck cards and eggs but it's also going to generate you food so if you're able to get all of these things cards tuck cards eggs and food in that single action then you can just focus on that and you won't have to spend turns laying eggs or gaining food from your forest so there's kind of two main types of cards that feed into a full tuck strategy so we've got those like the bush tip which let you tuck a card and lay an egg and those like the crow which let you discard eggs to gain food now there are some other kinds of birds so we've got hummingbirds which allow everyone to gain food from the bird feeder cards like the osprey or the phoebe that allow all players to gain a single type of food um, those also work very well in a full tuck but as long as you get something in there that's going to get you food you can make this work now this is going to work slightly differently to the previous kind of card drawing strategies in that you're not going to see as many cards you know with a full tuck you might only see two or three cards a turn in the early stage but just through sheer volume of turns drawing cards um, you can expect to find something good after not too long so in this example our inputs this time are going to be that there are 10 cards that we're looking for so in total there are 11 of these either tuck and draw or tuck and lay cards that can go in the wetlands um, but I'm going to assume that we've already played one so there's only going to be 10 more that we could possibly find and again out of uh, 180 cards in the deck so actually this is going to be the same breakdown as we saw for the forest bird scenario you know, we're still looking for 10 cards it's going to be 10 different cards but it's still 10 cards so the numbers are going to come out the same and so we'll see that our key outputs here are going to be that we have a 50% chance of finding one after 12 cards and our expectation is going to reach one after only 18 cards so you know, as I was saying before it's not in this case about volume of cards drawn in a single turn it's about the volume of turns spent drawing cards and you know if you're going to expect to find one after 18 cards if you're seeing maybe two or three cards a turn that's going to be somewhere between six and nine turns and the thing about full tuck is that those six to nine turns weren't spent doing nothing you know you'd be scoring points through tuck cards and eggs gaining food so by the time you've come across this kind of bird you're going to be ready to play it because you've already got eggs and food down and this kind of thing is going to accelerate you know, once you start adding these birds in you know suddenly if you add that third bird in your wetlands for a full tuck and you're able to see you know four or five cards a turn then that's just going to bring down the number of turns before you find the next one and really you can find that you're setting up this kind of full tuck engine very very quickly so now that we've taken a look at those four examples i just quickly want to run through um, how you can estimate these probabilities yourself at home 
So hopefully what you've seen from those uh, examples is that you know we don't really need that much information about the kind of cards we're looking for. You know, really what we need to know for our inputs is how many possible cards are there in the deck that we're looking for. So we use big K as in the original formula for this value. And we know again, our assumption here, that there are 180 total cards in the deck that we're going to be looking through. And so just fairly simply, the probability of drawing one of those from a single card is just going to be the ratio of these. So our probability is going to be K divided by 180. So obviously if K is 1, you've got a 1 in 180 chance of drawing it. If K is much larger, if K is 10 or 20 or even higher than that, you're going to have a greater probability of finding one. Now again, as in the previous examples, we can then you know, take a look at what is our expectation going to be after drawing n cards. And for those of you who aren't so interested in the maths, you'll be pleased to hear that this is a much more straightforward formula. So in this case, for finding the expectation, we just multiply n by the probability. So we have n times by k over 180. Now again, if we're going to look for you know, how many cards do we need to reach an expectation of 1, we can just put e equals to 1 in this formula. So we get 1 is n times k over 180. And then after a little bit of rearranging, we can find a value for n is just going to be 180 divided by k. So that is really straightforward. It's just 1 over our original probability. And you can see all you need to know is that value for k, for how many possible cards there are in the deck that you're looking for. So just to quickly demonstrate again how this works, we can go from our previous example where we had k is 10. You can quite easily see n is just going to be 180 divided by 10, which is 18, and that matches what we saw before. So we know our expectation is going to reach 1 after drawing 18 cards. So quite straightforward, the outputs there. If you have k cards of a certain type in the deck, then your expectation is going to reach 1 after 180 over k cards. And I see these questions quite a lot. You know, someone will say, OK, I have the fishery manager bonus. I need one more bird that's going to eat fish. How likely am I to draw that from the deck? And all you really need to know in this case is how many fish birds are there in the deck in total. And this is going to give you a good estimate for how likely you are to find one. So the last thing I want to talk about before I end the video is something that we on the Discord call Rule 16. So this is commonly known as if you draw a card from the tray, it will be replaced with an even better card. So this is where people are worried about drawing something from the tray because there's that risk what is going to come up from the deck in its place? You know, should I have drawn that from the deck instead and got something better? Um, you know, we can take a look at um, you know some of the chances of getting different kinds of cards. So again, as before, I'm going to kind of base this on uh, the tier list that I put together for Token Cash. So from that tier list, we know there are 35 cards in the deck out of 180 that are either in S or A tier. So that's about one in five. And even extending that to include B-tier birds, um, still less than 50%. So drawing a single card from the tray, you know, more often than not, it's not going to get replaced by a stronger card. So um, really, in most scenarios, I don't think you have too much to worry about taking something from the tray. Um, where this does change is where you have birds like the Brant. So the Brant lets you draw all three face-up cards in the bird tray. And so that tray is going to get completely reset for your opponent's turn. Now, it is certainly more risky playing the Brant. The chances are going to increase that you're going to reveal one of these strong cards the more cards that you reveal in the tray. And yeah, in the case of the Brant, it's about 50-50 um, of revealing either an S or A tier bird for your opponent. So this is really where you have to weigh up the kind of risk and reward um, of playing a bird like the Brant. You know, there's, there's clearly a reward here in that you're getting three cards in a single turn while also scoring points by playing a bird. You know, getting cards at the start of the game can often be really difficult. So this can help get you that head start by playing something like the Brant. But it's not without risk, you know, that 50-50 chance. If you're drawing a strong card yourself from the tray, then maybe it is worth that risk. But certainly if you're drawing three mediocre cards and you have a pretty good chance of revealing something strong for your opponent, that is certainly a risk that you've got to take into account when making this kind of decision. So that's everything I wanted to take a look at in regards to card drawing. And I think really, you know, there's some good key takeaways here. Certainly some good strategic points around building up that wetlands first. Certainly these strong 
wetland birds like the ruddy duck, common yellow throat, pipe bill grebe that are just going to allow you to see more cards and certainly increase your chances of getting those stronger birds quicker, allowing you to build up your engine and score more points. So thank you very much for watching. Um, there will be at least one or two more parts of this series that I'll be working on. So if you'd like to get notified when they come out, please do consider subscribing to my channel. But otherwise, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.